Good morning. Um, my name is Freeland. I work in Oxford at the Technical University of Oxford, Oxford Brookes University. And I'm the scientific coordinator of the WeKit project, the Horizon 2020 funded project on wearable experience for knowledge intensive training. I'm very thankful for being invited here so I can talk to you about professional tell, um, the next version, so to say, for changed circumstances in industrial training. But before I do so, I wanted to also acknowledge that this is, of course, not just my work, but rests on the shoulders of many, some of whom are here in the room. Ralf Klammer, Ala Wovk, Mikhail Fominik, and I think that's it from the project right now. So anything I get wrong, then um, blame me. And um, But uh, please also do talk to the other people in case you have further questions. I thought I'll talk a little bit about the context in which our work is based, then a little bit about the solution, which I call human performance augmentation, a new form of technology-enhanced learning. And uh, I will do so by illustrating that with the WeKit project, I'm talking a little bit about the framework we have, the learning framework. The reference architecture involved standards. We chair the development of um, the wearable computing aspect itself and some real films of trial impressions while finishing up then with a few findings. The context or the problem that we're facing. <clears throat> I'm sure every one of you has seen something like this here. Um, a infographic of Siemens in that case explaining what industry for zero is. Um, who, who of you has seen this or a similar infographic before about uh, Industry 4.0? Depends, Depends on how similar, but... Uh, yeah, they're, they're all slightly different, but they're all uh, kind of meaningless as well. So I thought I'll illustrate a little bit a few interesting aspects that clearly show us why things are changing. This here is a photo of um, a manufacturing plant of BMW with a lot of robots on there. That's certainly one of the first things that um, you would note in a modern factory. There are a lot of robotics. They don't look like humanoid robots. They are more like industrial arms or other forms of automation. But there are other changes that are a little bit more subtle um, that change the way we work. We work in these um, new factories. For example, supply chain management has significantly changed over time. Um, it's possible in some factories, in some modern factories, to automatically have the production machinery back order material um, from um, the supply chain. And there are a lot of companies in the surrounding that um, help with supply chain management and organization in an intelligent way. Um, in factories themselves, there you would find a lot of automated unmanned vehicles, some of them self-driving, some of them autonomous guided vehicles, uh, like here the auto, so they would have a, a strip on the floor and would just transport things around and stop whenever a pedestrian walks uh, into them. Um, but BMW, for example, is, and others, I'm sure, are currently running trials to, to, to use drones for last-minute delivery of parts in the factory. For example, when um, parts turn out to be damaged on the assembly line. So a drone would quickly get the stuff from the warehouse while the assembly line holds, while the assembly line stands still, which costs a lot of money, of course. And um, flying it quickly in may be more efficient, um, as they hope to see. Uh, robotics I already mentioned, but connected to that is also then the possibility to do predictive maintenance, to see that the machine must be serviced in two hours because um, certain parts are wearing down and um, the internal diagnostic systems indicate that it's time to, time to get a service, a treatment, a spa for the robot. And um, as a final one, that just um, also from, from the supply chain to the actual production, but also to the customers, things have changed. Um, you would find today quite a lot of product design shifted off to, to the well, consumers or at least um, the retail agents that um, take measurements, for example. Here it's an example of a prosthetic hand 
that is, of course, to be fitted precisely to the measures um, a person has and is then bespoke produced in a unit of one. So a lot of things have changed. Um, this is happening everywhere. You see here a selection of the, of the products um, that are European funded and uh, multi-region initiatives. Um, so you can see it's virtually anywhere, sometimes under different labels. In the UK they're called more um, catapults and um, the advanced manufacturing um, uh, catapult. In, in other countries they may have different names, but I'll just con put them together under the umbrella of Industry for Zero. This has, of course, um, created challenges in the, in the market, in the, in the work market. Um, the big question that many people have today is, will a robot take your job? Um, uh, amuse yourself and uh, go to that link and check out whether your job is at risk of automation. Um, the database behind this website um, has been produced by some colleagues at Oxford University in the Martin Institute of uh, Future Studies. They have um, analyzed job profiles with respect to certain uh, underlying skills and uh, predict in that uh, study whether if you are a van driver, for example, is anyone here a van driver? I don't want to make anyone. No? Okay. Um, whether a van driver, for example, would be at risk of automation in the next uh, few years. I, if you hack in researcher, then it comes out as this is very unlikely to be replaced by robots. Um, but there are certainly areas that are uh, at risk. Um, if you don't trust artificial intelligence, I should probably have mentioned that it's maybe not the wisest thing to use machine learning algorithms to codify job profiles and predict whether they will be replaced by artificial intelligences. Um, but there are other studies um, also from the Future Martin Institute um, that asked humans um, whether they think certain skills or certain uh, jobs will be replaced uh, by artificial intelligence in the future and and when. And there are some areas that are certainly considered also by humans quite risky. So the retail salesperson and um, maybe in, what's that, 35 years, uh, surgeons. Um, but there are other areas um, like an AI researcher that are considered as this will happen really late and as we know with predictions of humans over time um, well, this is probably not the best indicator to bet your horses on. Still, if we look at very serious studies and not coffee ground reading um, here an anal analysis of tasks in jobs um, by the OECD that says that today of all jobs we have, of all tasks we have at jobs, probably 9% are automatable. Doesn't mean it will happen. That's a choice whether we replace that uh, with automation, but it's possible. And I think that's a quite realistic estimate. I mean, I'm talking to researchers now, so I don't think anyone of you is really scared now about their future. Um, but I think nobody really needs to be scared because at the same time, in this changing environment, there are a lot of new jobs coming out. Um, at the moment, in the UK, and you would find a similar situation across Europe, one in four jobs are unfilled um, because you cannot find people that are qualified, you cannot find people that have experience, and that is a problem. So just to illustrate it a little bit more, um, in the UK, um, for example, if we trust the study of the EFF, EEF, sorry, um, manufacturing um, organization, then um, over the next three years there is a lot of demand in production and process engineers, mechanical engineers, design and development engineers, and, and, and. And if we look at what are the actual skills people are looking for, then throughout you find, uh, of course, soft skills like management skills, line management, leadership, but in production related, 
craft technician, sales and marketing, information technology, software development, and all that. So something is happening, times are changing. If you don't go with times, you go with time. Um, that's the situation that we're facing. And the solution that we have come up with, that we have been thinking about in that context, was that we could do something to support human performance, to augment human performance. That means um, create new workplaces with new tools, with new assistance systems for smart training, um, hopefully also more healthy workplaces. Every change on a grander scale Every new investment into workplace technology means that uh, we have another chance to get it right and um, yeah, not create um, mouse arms, uh, broken backs and uh, all the other things that we have managed to do with past workplaces. <coughs> the example here that I make is, um, well, we certainly have wearable technologies, most prominently at the moment certainly smart glasses, but other things are less visible and also find entry to the workplace, like Fitbit trackers to see if people live a healthy life at the workplace or posture trackers and so on. So we can certainly use these technologies and if we do it right, in theory, we should be able to help with up and reskilling, we should prevent unemployment, we should fix the skills gap and we should do so in a way that it's engaging, fun and healthy. Um, unraveling this a little bit more, we want to do performance augmentation. Performance augmentation, the word augmentation was carefully chosen because we can too far away. We can use, for example, augmented reality technologies to augment what people see, hear, feel. We um, can add in additional sensory experiences into what people perceive, so that it becomes, if it's done really well, um, quite indistinguishable from reality. So we can create a mixed and augmented reality using a multiplexer to feed into gateway devices, um, other additional sensory experiences or alter existing sensory experiences um, to change perception and ultimately change then the experience built from perception. So we're aiming at um, creating uh, uh, better memories, if you want, uh, better episodic, sensory, semantic memories that can be recalled in, in, in the context of your workplace better, um, uh, or even motoric memories um, by helping people to practice um, in, in advance, build up knowledge, skills, other abilities um, to, to build up competence. So, use real, a mixture of real training, training in the real world, added with additional virtual elements, highlighting stuff, providing additional input, explaining things in a better way and so on, with sensor information. Multiplex that into the de delivery devices, change perception, build experience. That is what human performance augmentation is about. Um, yeah, so if you look carefully, you can see that this here is of course not real. Who would have an astronaut floating in their living room? But even though this is just a snapshot of, a, um, yeah, of an experience that is 3D, you can, it, it still looks quite good. The real thing looks much better. And you can see here it's transparent because it uses a certain augmentation technology. There are lots of different technologies available. There are lots of different sensors available. I'll, I'll come to that. So what do we do in Wikit? In Wikit, we try to fix this skills gap and uh, do human performance augmentation, and that in three phases. We capture what the expert does using sensors, then we clean up that experience that has been recorded, make it available to trainees so they can wear the experience, they can experience something in the real space, train in, the, in a kind of wet rehearsal, 
and we provide then, that's what we're working on now in this next phase, um, analysis and post-processing instruments as well, so the learning analytics for the real-world interaction. We have thought a lot about this capturing aspect and the delivery aspect and done um, an intensive phase of requirements engineering with a lot of paper we produced and we have condensed condensed the requirements into a task slash transfer mechanism framework. So the, the tasks, if we classify tasks in the workplace with respect to, to what people um, learn and what they do, perceptual task, high memory task, collaborative task, decision making, high speed, motor performance, we can also look at um, the affordances we have at hand in the technology we select. So we can, for example, use interactive virtual objects that float in the space with you and explain how you need to do things. Or we can provide haptic feedback. We can use highlights to direct people's attention to something. And um, yeah, that gave us a, a list of 18 at the moment transfer mechanisms that fall into these different groups here. Um, I'm not going to go into detail for all of them, but I will provide you in the next slide with a short film with a few examples on how you can direct focus. I think there may be a point of view video embedded, um, how you can do object enrichment and 3D models, other types of annotations, and we'll come later to the more complicated ones that use additional sensor recordings. So this here is um, a 2D recording of a 3D experience um, filmed through a camera and then mounting all the digital elements that the user sees floating as a hologram in their space into the video feed. So it looks quite bad. So you've seen now part of the authoring tool, that radial menu where somebody selects an annotation and places it somewhere in space on the object here, a corner of an airplane, adding an audio annotation, um, doing a recording then. I hope I have the sound on. Uh, it's not in the film. We didn't record the audio of that one. Um, so you're adding um, recordings, you're adding annotations, you're adding 3D content. <laughs> sequencing a procedure, in this case a pre-flight check on a Beechcraft airplane, bit by bit with the different stations you have to visit on the plane and check from the door and some rack mounting procedures um, to the middle of the plane and now here in the cockpit. Um, this is what it looks like for the expert when you record that experience and there are some additional aspects. It looks then quite different for the learner. For the learner, this is mapped then to a linear task list, and you navigate through it by saying next and explain things. We'll see that in a second. But um, before I go deeper into that, let me just illustrate um, a little bit more the technical uh, aspects of the project. So we build a reference architecture for human performance augmentation, which essentially consists of four systems that then have um, from the user interfaces to the service layer to the data layer different um, databases and services connected to it. We have a recorder application which is used to record what the expert does with help. So the expert says some things explicitly, selects an annotation, records an audio and things like that. Um, but some things are also happening automatically so we have a mode where the expert just walks around and it will be recorded. Then we have the reenactment client. We have a live guide that is from the user interface much more simple to use, much more linear guiding the user step by step through a procedure and much more, yeah, much more consumer oriented focusing really on the learning content. Um, we're working on the analytics side, so that after your learning experience you can revisit 
the timeline, look at it where you might have had difficulties, look at some additional sensor input, stress level, for example, um, to reflect on your learning and make decisions about future learning. And then we have the community aspects coming with it, of course, uh, user databases, um, the repository, um, the requirements, bazaar and community. These then require different services below and different databases. I'm not going to go into detail, but this architecture can be used to implement your own systems. We have um, developed a content model, which um, we also have driven to standardization within the IEEE, the International Engineering Society. Um, we are, we have balloted it now, the, the spec, with uh, about 200 members of um, the, the working group, or we drew people from a pool of 200 members of the working group, of um, the computer society in the IEEE, which is huge, and some other groups, and have basically the go, but still need to fix a number of 126 comments before we submit it for standardization in October. But come, deadline is October for submission, come December, this should be a standard. What it does is um, it standardizes the way you describe learning activities in the real world, and it standardizes how you describe the real world, the workplace, the classroom. Um, the difference between the two is classrooms and workplaces change rarely. So all the descriptions of which tools exist, which locations may be relevant, that's quite stable and can also be exchanged and can be used to create learning activities much more easily. If you know how to detect a certain tool, if you know how to detect a certain location, then um, bootstrapping from that a description of first do this, then do that, then do that becomes quite easy. So we have um, developed this um, spec, which allows also to harvest content across repositories, kind of throw the additional information in. In an industrial context, this means typically things would come from a uh, knowledge base or technical documentation in a university or school context, probably more from a learning management system or textbook. Um, but there are additional elements like 3D models which would come from CAD, uh, or uh, customer information, which would come from, from customer relationship management systems, product lifecycle management systems, spare part catalogs, and so on. So in real life situations, the information is somewhere already, and the content format also serves as a kind of uh, container to collect everything. That is um, the content model and the architecture. Now to the wearable solution. Um, we have focused a lot in the first phase on the smart glasses. That's now a big word for a lot of sensors. Smart glasses contain multiple cameras, optical cameras for filming what you see, but also infrared cameras to map the environment. They contain a gyroscope typically. So you can look at uh, where, the, where the user is gazing um, and, and look at the accelerometer data. So if you want to see how quickly somebody is walking indirectly through the processing of the environment. So it really scans the room and maps out the room. Through that, you also know where the user stands in, in the room. So that's, that's already a lot of information we just get from the glasses. Through using software processing uh, on the image data, on the video data, we can also figure out what it is the user looks at. So we can recognize objects, we can recognize locations, so there's semantics coming in. But there's something that we don't get, especially with respect to what the expert does. Um, why, that's why we're hooking it up with additional sensors. So we're using uh, a muscle armband um, to track um, the arm movement and um, some bits and pieces of, of hand movement. Um, we are not quite sure whether we keep that. Um, we are using a leap motion to uh, scan in real time the, the actual hand movement, which gives really cool visualizations and which are very useful for kind of hands-on instruction. 
we use an EEG to map out whether people pay attention. Um, yeah, and we have been discussing uh, variable heart rate to look also into stress levels and um, forgetting now something, but it's not that important. Yeah, so key sensors are the smart glasses and the armbands. And for others, we're still deliberating a little bit. What does this allow us to do? It allows us to record um, right. se seamlessly so what the expert does. So you hear an expert now demonstrating something and explaining what they do. Open this little panel. Check the accumulator level. And in a second, we will then see the replay, what it looks like to the learner. So, expert walks through the room, looks at things, does activities, and explains what needs to be done. And um, we then take this data of the sensor recording, map it to something trial participants called the penguin or the cyclops, where you, where you see them, you hear the voice of the expert in your hand and you see this floating ghost, that's what we call it, um, the ghost track in the room that allows you to see what the expert does. As said, this is a 2D recording of something that is essentially 3D. So it looks much better in real life. You have to imagine you really see a shimmering hologram in the room with you that you like to, you like to touch. So if it's something um, less abstract than the ghost that we've seen here, then some people that we demonstrate stuff to, they, they start giggling or they really want to touch things. Um, we have investigated this now in a first wave of trials. We ran trials with astronauts on a module of the International Space Station on the ground, but we're aiming higher next year. Um, we have run trials with um, radiologists and doctors in training in radiology. Um, we have run trials with the airplane maintenance engineers and nautical engineers and um, students of them then as well, not just the, the experts. Um, and we focused in this first wave in particular on usability, user experience, user satisfaction aspects, checking also whether our affordances are kind of working, and uh, technology acceptance and use. And I'll just pick um, a few small examples from that. You will have to follow the papers we're currently writing and the deliverables that are already out there to uh, gain a bit more insight. So with respect to system usability, we found um, we used system usability scores, which are a cheap way with 10 questions to establish whether the usability is on a level that is acceptable, which is here. So the acceptable level of high usability is, um, is uh, over there. Um, so it's a norm scale with uh, 0 to 100. Our solution currently is at 66.4. If we combine the data for the recorder and the player, although they're quite different in the usability, the player is much more usable, um, of course, because we don't train learners on how to use it. Experts, however, we train them or we expect to train them because it's not super easy to produce good content. Um, so they. they uh, player solution um, should be a bit uh, more usable than the, the actual uh, recorder solution at the moment, although they're not very far apart. Um, but we hope that in the second wave we, of course, go from good to something, something further down the line, and we've already identified what's required to do so. Um, with respect to technology acceptance, um, technology acceptance is a complicated thing typically a lot of different um, groups of variables that influence each other. Um, if we look at the key ones um, with respect to performance expectancy, um, the, the findings we found was that it's not bad. So here in the middle would be kind of neutral. Um, neither agree nor disagree. 
Um, up here, that's kind of an area where we can kind of indicatively say, yeah, seems to work, but it's certainly not a strong agreement yet. Um, so with respect to performance expectancy, people will use a solution if they expect it will help them to perform better. Um, there is a, a good trend that we're on a good way. With respect to effort expectancy, that's the same. So there's a good trend, the median is even clearly agree. Effort expectancy means, do I need to invest a lot of time to learn how to use it? Uh, they don't. Um, similarly, where's the item connected to it here? Learnability, um, that is a reverse item, it's negatively formulated, so you have to flip that up. Uh, it's also quite high. And um, a lot of other aspects. In the workplace, people expect um, that uh, interoperability will be a challenge to master so that it works with the existing systems. Um, yeah, a lot of information we can derive for that. But it's a complicated picture and the trend with this current stage is um, that, we, that we're doing good. Um, similarly with the transfer mechanisms, um, there's generally quite a good agreement for the ones that we had implemented. There are a few still missing that uh, people somewhat agree that they can work with that functionality. And additionally, we also um, looked into simulator sickness where we found basically no simulator sickness. You know from virtual reality devices that people, when they wear them and walk around them half an hour, that they need an hour of recovery so they don't vomit um, if the application is done badly, um, if the application is done well and the hardware is good. And it's not so bad, but it's, um, from what we can say now, um, the augmented reality devices basically don't have that problem. So there's a bit of um, issue here in the disorientation area, which we attribute more to the setup of our trials. That was in the space test bed where people were standing on a platform and the, what they saw was a bit too big, so they were tempted to step off and fall off the platform which is an issue that has maybe more to do with the setup of our trial than the actual system. And um, yeah, I'm not going to, into detail about the stress on the eye that it leaves. But that may also be that people had not been using this regularly. Yeah, um, user satisfaction with the interaction on this mask glasses was also rather high. In the next cycle, we will test um, effectiveness, efficiency, and memorability and also try to look into cognitive loads so that we have hard data on how this would impact um, businesses. Um, but these experiments are quite difficult to design. Yeah, so that's it. I've shown you a bit the context, Industry 4.0. I've shown you a bit the solution, performance augmentation, illustrated that with the Wicked example. You've seen a few films. Um, I think there's somewhere a video rotation. Maybe we could put some more film material into the video rotation. Um, so you can see how that looked like in the space test bed and in the medicine. Um, medicine you can also see in Alas talk this afternoon at 4.30, I mean to say. 5.30. 5.30 in which room? Uh, 06.4. 06.4. Or... Where we will talk about the affordances in more depth and show examples from our medical test bed. But for now, that leaves me with uh, thanks for the attention and um, I'm open for questions. Okay. Uh, I already have two questions on the SLIDO uh, system. So Mikhail is asking, uh, do you elaborate on learning analytics for active hands-on learning? Uh, Professor Fisher mentioned the learning analytics together with the MOOCs and standard tests. Mm -hmm. So, yes, especially in the content model in Arlem, we have foreseen a hook for XAPI, which is an interface for logging um, interaction data to build learning analytics from it. And um, in that phase, we're, we're looking now into the analytics. So we've just drafted um, here at our project meeting that we held in the context of the conference, the use cases and requirements. Um, what you would like to see, for example, um, with respect to location information and the additional sensor data available. 
and we're elaborating that. There's also a new EU project um, that we are leading um, called Learning Analytics for Augmented Reality, in which, which is an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership where we will investigate that also further. So yes, we're working on that. We've run some initial tests already in predecessor projects and where there are some publications out there on how to use learning analytics on the shop floor in the real world using AR. And um, it's, it's doable. Um, people have to be careful, of course, and seek agreement, work with uh, with uh, worker councils and representatives to make sure that since this is dealing with privacy sensitive data that every, everybody's happy but um, it's it's doable and it's beneficial